Hello, everyone. Welcome to Mupo and Friends. We are Justin Pearson. And I am Michelle Mupo. We're brought to you by Mupo TV. And you can catch all our shows at www.mupoentertainment.com. And you can also live chat with us every Sunday at 2 p.m. Eastern on our YouTube channel during the premiere of each episode. Tune in Sundays, 2 p.m. Eastern, because our chats are rocking. And I have to say, we've had some pretty cool guests who even shared things that they've never shared anywhere else, but they shared it on Mupo and Friends. I know, right? Thank you, everyone, for tuning in to our show where we love bringing you awesome celebrities and entrepreneurs you want to know. So, Michelle, did you have a Mupo awesome week? I absolutely did have a Mupo awesome week. How about you? Did you have one? I know you did. I did. I came back from an amazing event, which I know we'll probably hear a little bit more on further. Awesome. Well, we're going to take a quick commercial break and we'll be back with our special guest. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Mupo and Friends. Our special guest today is a seven-figure earning coach, mentor, author, and speaker. He's coached icons, legends, titans of industry, sport, entertainment, and politics for over 25 years and is known as the coach to coaches. Please welcome Richard Dolan. Hey, Rich, how are you? What's up? What's up? Good to be here. What's up, Jessalyn? What's up, so Michelle honored. Mupo? So, so honored. Honored. It's this, I that's people. Cool. Thank you. better than having any, any, anyone you can ever imagine. This is it. It's, it's unbelievable. Well, I'm going to start off because I wanted to ask you, you were mentored by some of the world's best financial minds. Can you tell us a little bit about them? Well, I mean, look, I, I started really young at the dawn of the dinosaur. So for me, I mean, everyone was a mentor. And so for the old timers, and I mean, those who understand what mentoring even means, it means to be trained, developed, and brought up in an industry in a skill set or in a craft without pay. And so often people would confuse a boss or a sales manager or someone that you reported up to with someone that would mentor you. And that's not necessarily true. They may guide you. They tell you what to do. They'll assign you a task, but they wouldn't mentor you. They wouldn't watch after you, watch your back and perhaps tell you where to go, like right versus left or left versus right. So for me, I was lucky. I, I fell into the financial services business real young. And as a result, during that time, uh, at the crack of the 90s, uh, technology showed up. I mean, digitization showed up. I mean, the, uh, the, the, the true revolution of industry began. The decentralization of banks begun. And so with all of that going on, it was a very interesting time. So for me, I mean, the legends, the leaders, the icons, and those I looked up to at that time were just those guys who weren't bringing lunch to work in a paper bag like me. I mean, it was always the guys who just didn't have to jump on the bus and, and worry about a transfer coupon to get to the next connection. I mean, they had chauffeurs, Rolls Royces, uh, and I mean, just those they would call their ride home. And so for me, it was, it was just really anyone that made a lot of money was worth being mentored by. So for me, Michelle uh, and friends, it was really I was just super grateful to be able to be surrounded by such an immense amount of both wealth and accomplishment. So I've got to say the whole world was my mentor, really. There was no one in particular uh, mentor that I would have to say earned all the right, got all the privilege or do most of the heavy lifting. I mean, those who recognize hustle in someone helps that one. And for me, that's what it came down to. I was really willing to work hard and do what I needed to do to get tasks done and, and the job accomplished. So I was just very lucky to be in a village of accomplished folks that said, hey, this kid's got some real grit. Let's let's cultivate them. Awesome. So you weren't happy, Rich, about the nickname Richie Rich as a kid, having said it was for the wrong reasons. Has your perspective on that nickname changed and why? Mm, that's a cute question. Only because I haven't heard <laughs> Richie Rich in a long time. But, but I mean, you're talking about a story 
that I once was asked by one of my coaches to say, you know, why don't you tell the story about how you became to be? And in there, I declare that one of the really tough things that I had to grow through was this thing being called Richie Rich. So for anyone that was growing up in the 70s or 80s might recall that that, you know, 60s character of a blonde haired boy that grew up quite wealthy, his name was Richie Rich. And what made him so super cool was he had all the coolest things, the coolest gizmos and toys. Uh, I mean, pet dog name, billions. Uh, I mean, the list goes on. But I wasn't wealthy. I mean, I came from a very uh, low income family. I came from a broken home. And although I once in a while would get a very cool toy that my friends wouldn't have, it didn't make me rich. So being called Richie Rich was really insulting because I was far from rich uh, and we were far from wealthy. But I was called that and that was a name that I didn't really appreciate. I, I didn't look like Richie Rich. I wasn't blonde, as you can clearly tell. I didn't have a dog, which was really upsetting. And uh, But I didn't have a private jet and I didn't live in a mansion. I mean, I was an inner city kid. I mean, who, who, who would fight every day to get a seat at the table in the cafeteria that always, in fact, found himself in a, a, a brawl off come afternoon recess somehow, um, who struggled with school, who struggled with uh, parents who were going through a divorce, um, you know, who struggled through a real tough time, uh, given my parents were interracial and uh, being a 70s kid. I mean, that was just a tough time to be an interracial byproduct of, of a romance gone wrong. So for, for me, I think Richie Rich was just a very interesting time more than anything else, rather than an identifier. I think it was a real uh, character that I didn't identify with. Uh, but to this day and in my home, uh, I've got plenty of, of pictures and art that actually depict Richie Rich because it's a great reminder of where I came from, but not, that's not, not necessarily someone I was inspired by. Hmm. Well, how has the 10X mindset actually changed the way you look at things? Well, you know, when I met Grant about a couple of years ago, it, it was at a time that I was heading into a transition. I mean, Michelle, I, I was a president and, and partner in a multi-million dollar company that was serving thousands of people, creating and, and, and realizing financial independence for themselves through real estate. I was comfortable by any measure. But for me, there was something very wrong about that. I felt either comfortable uh, or complacent. But either way, I know that's going to bring crisis. And that might be because of the training I've had. That might just be of the development I've endured. Or that just might just be just good old fashioned gut check, right? Just intuition. So I knew that something was going to happen. And so when I met Grant Cardone and chatting with him about working alongside each other is as he was to grow his digital footprint. And of course, his commercial act was to be global. Uh, he had this conversation, this standard called 10X. And I found it fascinating. I thought it was just a bumper sticker and a cool battle cry, but it was really more than that. It was a philosophy that whatever you were going to do and whatever you were pursuing, it was worth 10 Xing as in, you know, you, you want a dollar, make it a hundred. If you want a hundred, make it, you know, a thousand and on it goes, you see the point, but it also worked in terms of time. If you want to do that in a week, why don't you do it today? If you wanted to, in fact, lose uh, weight in a year, why don't you start to, you know, today? And, and so it was, really an accelerator and amplifier of action. And, and so what 10X really meant for me was it served as a real wake up call to realize that we don't know if tomorrow's going to be actually a, a sure thing. We don't know if, if life is gonna provide us the 10 years we need. We, we don't know what the future holds for us. So whatever it is that you want, whatever it is that you're wishing, whatever it is that you wish to pursue is really in fact worth shifting your relationship to the speed and velocity in which you move at called 10x. So I have to thank Grant for really represencing me to, uh, to speed, to action, to massive action. And, and for those things, that's, that's what 10x means for me. It's, it's truly the standard one uh, strives for and should never achieve. I love that standard. And I actually appreciate uh, what it means and obviously where it comes from. And I'm very grateful for having been brought into that world. Um, could you tell us about Adversity Quotient and how this led to your first book? Well, wow, that's a real walk down memory lane. You guys certainly have done your homework. I mean, <laughs> Adversity Quotient was written by a man by the name of Dr. Paul Stoltz, who certainly served as one of my first mentors. He, he, he certainly was uh, responsible for me shaping my relationship to what it means to understand the psychology of human beingness. Um, you know, as a doctor, I mean, this man is, is a real astute individual who founded Adversity Quotient, which is, which is one's AQ. 
Now, what's interesting about AQ is it's not like your, your IQ. When you think about your IQ, your intellectual quotient, it measures just your intellectual ability. And when you think of your EQ, your emotional quotient, that's, that's a little bit different too. But between your emotional quotient and your intellectual quotient, neither quotient is a great predeterminating factor of success. The only one that is, is your AQ, your adversity response profile, your ability to turn adversity into opportunity or your response ability the moment crisis strikes. I just found that fascinating. I thought, wow, you can actually predict people who will be successful. And, and so he created the science around predicting whom would be successful in spite of crisis. And so I studied under him and then I represented him. And then I took the Canadian rights to his technology and championed his cause for years. So um, it led to my lobbying and procurement of my very first publication with them, which I mean, when I look at what I wanted it to be called, it was supposed to be adversity quotient for money because I was in the money business, but his publisher wouldn't allow it because it would be a, a bit of a breach of brand given it was AQ and AQ only. So right around that time, as we were struggling, two things happened. One was Michael Jackson had released a new album and the album was called Invincible. And simultaneously and around the same time, 9-11 occurred. And I mean, once 9-11 occurred, I mean, the whole world changed. I mean, everything we knew, everything we presumed, everything we were taught was now, well, dated. As that was the single greatest geopolitical, socioeconomic, seismic shift in our existence, as we know it. The, 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 the day those towers came crumbling down, everything changed. And so the combination of both the event and of course the recollection of Michael Jackson uh, releasing this, this, this album named Invincible, we came up with Invincible Investor. And so we branded our very first co-authorship called The Invincible Investor, which really was the embodiment of his technology combined with research areas such as behavioral finance and happiness economics and investor resilience all into a book. So it, it was cool. I mean, I, I, what can I say? To, to, to be able to have been published alongside my mentor and a man who, I mean, who made two appearances on Oprah, who's a international best-selling author, who's earned millions of dollars, multiple millions on an, a per annum basis, uh, running a very cool boutique shop. Um, what an honor, what, what a flattering honor to be a part of that initiative and to have actually gotten into the world that way. So uh, that's, that's who Paul was, that's what the technology was, and that's how, that's how my first book came to be. Mm, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. I, I I'm, my goal now is to be in a book with you. So ah, I'm just telling, I'm go. just telling you that because Let's that, go. because you're my, you're, you're like the, you know, how do we say it? The King of all Kings when it comes oh, to come on now. I, I mean, so, look at girl, you know, you're, you're someone who really gets quite lit up by people who are, and I love that about you. I love very that. Few you're, people. Very yeah, few but people. You're, you're, you're an able and willing and committed body who understands the importance and the laws of and the magic to collaborating with people that are really on fire and doing that thing. So, hey, I'm 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 always ears for you. You know that because we're we're this is Mupo and friends, not you know Mupo and wannabes and or or Mupo and and can't bees. This is I'm a friend, so I'm here for you. Right on, right on. Well, we have um, a lot of people have asked in the Mupo Familia. So one of the questions that they wanted to know was, what are three strategies that you would actually teach to become a motivational speaker? Mm. Well, I think the first question you've got to ask yourself is, is the first strategy is find out why. You know, why do you want to be a motivational speaker? I mean, for me, I grew up in the motivational speaking business. And I resisted for years being called a motivational speaker. In fact, if you ever were to do the research and take a look at any of my sizzle reels, there's this one particular clip that I remember when I first got to work with President William Jefferson Clinton. And I really badly wanted him to give me an endorsement because, I mean, that's what it was all about, right? Getting endorsements, getting testimonials, putting them on the back of your books back in that time. But rather than doing that and knowing that I'd love that to happen, he did a different thing. He did a shout out and he shouted my name out from the podium and said, well, you know, want to thank Mr. Richard Dolan for that kind introduction. And he says that since he's a motivational speaker, maybe I should be introducing him. 
Now, as amazing as that was to hear those words come through those lips of a president, I mean, I was like, I was just blown away and sadly so because I, was, I, don't, I didn't identify myself as a motivational speaker. I felt like it was a real big no-no. I mean, anyone that was a motivational speaker would obviously be seen as a counterfeit because the only motivational speaker at that time, and maybe even to this time, that I say truly exists and is the King Kong of all motivational speakers is Tony Robbins. So maybe, just maybe, right, Michelle and Jessalyn and friends, I mean, just maybe I was, I just didn't want to be a counterfeit. I, I didn't want to be a knockoff. I didn't, I, I didn't want to be born on Canal Street. You know what I'm saying? I didn't want to come off, like, I, I didn't want to be Hugo Bass or, or, or Gachi or, or, or Channel, you know? I mean, I didn't want to be a knockoff. And so I really resisted the idea of being seen or confirmed as a motivational speaker. So, I mean, the first thing for anyone that wants to be a motivational speaker is just really ask yourself, what's the difference you really want to make? Because that's where, where the title might be. That's where the concept might live. So to me and today, I likely identify more as a speaker, as an author, as a coach, than I do a motivational speaker or an inspirer or a catalyst for contribution and chaos. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, being an agent of global domination sounds cool, but I mean, it's just, why pigeonhole yourself? Why, why call yourself something that becomes more like a role you'd play in a movie or in a film rather than being the person you're just built to be and let the world let you in. The second thing I would then do is just really get clear as to the process or the playbook, your approach. Like what's, what's your system of getting it done? I mean, that thing over there, Rich, it, it's, it's my nickname. It's also a short form for my name, which is Richard. But, but it stands as an acronym, which is Realizing I Create Happiness. So it, it really serves as a keystone for me to always be present, always be present, always be present to what I've got to do. So realizing I create happiness, if I'm not creating happiness, then what am I doing, right? And, and so you've got to just really find your North Star. You've got to find where it is you really feel your contribution is going to be measurably made so you can consistently do that. Uh, gosh, Michelle and Jesslyn and friends, I mean, I've come across people who are really good in a conversation and they actually listened and leaned into a girlfriend at a bar or, you know, a pal listened to a fellow buddy, you know, rhyme off all the reasons why they feel like their life sucks. And at the end of those conversations, people feel heard and they feel appreciated and they feel discovered and they go, man, you're good at this. And all of a sudden you as the who you think is the coach or the speaker or the motivational speaker says, oh my God, I should make a business out of this. No, you shouldn't. You, you're just a great human being in a moment. So don't get high in your own supply of, of encouragement and acknowledgement. You got to slow down before you speed up. So number one, why do you want to become whatever it is that you're saying? Number two is, is really make sure that you've got a system or process or, or playbook. I'm very methodical about what I do. I follow processes all the time because that's why I can always assure myself and my clients and those who follow me that I will always get to the result I need to get to because I'm following the recipe. But third, the third and most important though, and I do mean it most important, is, is, it, is it, it's, it's got to be more than play. It's got to be about pay. I mean, linking a paycheck to purpose is important. I mean, making a difference is cool, but you got to make a dollar too. And so you've got to make sure that you don't go broke and you don't starve yourself to death making a difference. I mean, chivalry is beautiful. Mother Teresa was beautiful. I mean, Mahatma Gandhi was amazing, but we don't see too many Mahatma Gandhis today. And we don't see a lot of Mother Teresas either. And, and as a result, you've got to know that whether you call it philanthropy or contribution or giving or paying it forward, you got to pay rent. You got to put food on the table. You got to take care Amen. of yourself. And, and you got to know that making a difference doesn't come at the expense of funding and fueling your plane, your jet, your helicopter, your fourth car. It's just knowing that if you're going to provide value, it's fair and proportionate to charge a fee. So you've got to really be at home. You've got to grow the comfort. You've got to really be confident that if you are going to be a motivational speaker, let's say a life coach, a speaker, a trainer, a mentor, or whomever that is, a person of influence, and you're going to follow a system, whether you build it yourself and tested it on yourself and you're a demonstration of it working, or you license one from a Grant Cardone or a Tony Robbins or, or even myself, 
and, and now you apply it, then when you do and it does deliver, charge for it. Because that's what your lawyer would do or an accountant or a financial advisor or, or, or anyone that provides a service. And I almost guarantee you, we're never always happy with the services we get, but we get the bill and must pay. So those are the three, I wouldn't say they're strategies. I think they're just really internal conversations to have first before you deploy any strategy next. Yeah, those are, those are all great. Thanks, Rich. Um, do you have any rituals you do before you get on stage to get into your zone? Yeah, I sleep. That's the big one. I really enjoy sleeping. I mean, that's, I mean, I really do. I'm, but I mean that it's really easy for people to lose a lot of sleep before they get on a stage. And so that can only make matters worse. So you've got to take sleep really super seriously. But I, I mean, look, Jessalyn, for, for me, it depends on the stage. It depends on the place. It depends on the job. I mean, I just recently led a workshop for two days for a hundred people, a very exclusive retreat for people who were wanting to locate their voice. So it was all about speaking and conversing, connecting and doing so with uh, power, grace and ease. It, it was the kind of talk and the kind of program that required a lot of engagement, but, but it didn't, I didn't want it to come at the great expense of myself. And so it wasn't all about hype and jumping up and, and, and singing along and dancing along. It, it was about really keeping it cool and keeping people present to just who they were and what they came for. So in a position like that, there, there was no real true ritual other than making sure I was resting well, eating well, hydrating always, and keeping my, my voice box intact by way of you know hydrating, uh, drinking some hot tea with some lemon and uh, some honey, which is always cool. But, but in terms of like, if you had to perform, like you had to really like turn it on, like, I mean, like really crank it. I mean, I could tell you the truth or I can tell you what you likely want to hear. I mean, what you likely want to hear is I do a couple of really cool, like power moves that bring my body into motion. I can probably tell you that I know I can do it. I'm here to make a difference because realizing I create happiness. Oh, and I can, now I've got a mantra. I can tell you that I cold my mind and I envision the audience. I can feel their vibration and I can sense their energy. I can tell you that. And all of that could be true. And all of that does work. But to be really brutally honest, I get, I do one thing and I get present to this one thing. And this is all I do is I just basically zero in and I think about what is the net result for me being here? Why are they here? Why have they come? And what must I do that would leave them pleased having shown up? And as long as I'm present to why they're here, it's kind of like what a pastor would do, you know, a head of state would do, and, and perhaps even what a, what, what, a, what a statesman might do. It's just getting really clear to the one thing. And so with all the other things that could be seen as theatrics and disgenuine and, and almost, and not to knock any other speaker that does this, but a little bit inauthentic, I feel like all that stuff I just showed you, and I can come up with a dozen more examples of what pre-presentation modalities of preparation looks like. It's inauthentic. It, it has me have a departure from, from who I really just am. Why must I become that? Why must I vibrate like that? Why must I generate that? When I should just be me, step into the commitment and deliver. And if I deliver and satisfy delivery requests and the expectations of me, both of myself and from others, then I'm on point. There, there's nothing to get resolved for myself. But for those who are new to it, just getting started, and you're nervous as hell and shitting bricks and wetting your pants, yes, you'll need the modalities of coping with nerves, coping with your upset, coping with the crisis. Do I know my stuff? Do I have my stuff? And so there's a whole bunch of stuff you'll have to conspire and manipulate. And so it could just tell you three things. One is that you may not be ready. Two, you may not be well-practiced. Or three, you're neither of those two and you're just going to have to just bear and grin it because you're on the learning curve. That's some great advice. Thank you. All right. We're going to take a commercial break and we'll be right back. Hello, 
everyone, and we are back with my favorite speaker, Richard Dolan. So, um, Richard, can you please just tell us about Rich Speaks? Because this is what I was dying to hear. I know, I know. And we were talking about this at the break saying, come on, Michelle, Rich Speaks is, is one of many events. So let me just give you a little of the philosophy. So here, here's what I've learned in the 30 years of observing some of the most powerful, most influential, and most charismatic leaders I've come to know, that they are all human beings like you and I. And so if you observe them long enough, and if you study them long enough, and if you make note of it well enough, you all could reverse engineer them. And so for me, what I've done for 20 years is I actually did just that. In fact, I have a bunch right here. Let me just do this real quick, only because we're here. You see these? Yes. This is an example of just four journals. I have thousands of these, where if I open these, you'll see there's copious notes that I take of people I've worked with, observed, and have in fact studied. So what, what rich events does is it finds a topic that really matters to our students and followers and zeroes in on developing an academic event, whether over a day or two or three, where we actually develop for them mastery in a specific domain. That's right, so mastery in a specific domain. So recently, we just did an event called Rich Speaks. And Rich Speaks is all about getting people to powerfully realize, reclaim, and restore their voice. So in the world of communication, how one speaks is equal and proportionate to how one succeeds. No voice, no success. So for two days, we worked with people to in fact rediscover, redefine, and then reclaim their voice. And it was powerful. I mean, we were inside of a room. We spread across a room. We were on stages. Everyone spoke. They filmed themselves. They recorded stuff. We even went on the beach, Michelle, and did exercises on a beach in the sun, having fun, getting some sun. It was amazing. And so all of my work is always breakthrough thinking. So we have Rich Wealth, Rich Speaks. There's also Rich Ladies. I'm really happy to say that come fall, we'll have Rich Kids and Rich Teens, which I'm very passionate about. Um, wow. And it's all about just picking various domains of, of existence and saying, let's transform that area through education or that or that. So, um, so yeah, you missed a big one. And there's plenty more. It will be plenty more. But um, it's exciting. I mean, Jessalyn, you were at Rich Speaks. What did you think of Rich Speaks? Um, 100%. It is breakthrough. Uh, I watched people transform there. I myself have come back different than who I started. And that was a two-day event. So, yeah, I, I loved it. It was phenomenal. Awesome. Yeah. I know I followed, I followed you and promoted you the whole weekend. So I, <laughs> I saw everyone post and I, and I was like, oh, my God, please, why couldn't I be there? I'm telling you, this is anything you do is, is special. It's like, you know, it's something you want to just claim and do. I just really wish you do it in New Jersey. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost, it's close. I mean, I could show you something, but I can't yet. I don't know if I have it right in front of me, but probably not, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you something. And the reason why our stuff is starting to really click is because it's really moving the needle for people. I mean, it just is. I mean, I've been a part of the seminars, workshops, conferences, where it's it's a lot of stuff, but it doesn't really translate into someone walking out of a room saying, "Oh my God, I really got something," and now my the the my the, the trajectory of my life just altered just a little bit, just, just enough to feel like there was a difference made. It's it's been set up. I mean, the whole self help, self discovery human betterment space, this multi-billion dollar industry is rigged to serve guys like me and not serve people like you. And so for me, and I know a number of other brave souls are starting to say, no, that, that shouldn't be. Let's, let's do a couple of things that no one else is willing to do. Let's make sure that we deliver 100% of what we said we would. Let's make sure that people can actually say by, by admitting and then declaring, I got what I came for. That's nice for a change. And three, Let's, let's do something different. Let's make sure that at the end of two days or three days, whatever we do, nothing is sold at the back of a room. No act right oh now. Not, not like go grab your credit card. Let's increase your limit. Let's charge you a whack of money so that you can go broke and I can get rich and you can figure it out on your own. No, no. I mean, and Mich I mean look, Michelle, Jesslyn's right here. She, she was at the event. We sold nothing. Oh, with the exception of this right here, 
we had like, you know, of course, rubber I bands. I, I would buy one. But you know what this is? This, this is a life-saving device. So if you ever are in the deep waters of any ocean, we just pull you in this way. So it's actually a really great life preserver. Um, but all kidding aside, I mean, aside from t-shirts and hats, it, 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 we, we didn't promote stuff because people should feel that the safety and confidence of a learning environment should be really truly about you and learning, not you and us selling. Yeah, and that's 100% exactly what it was and how it went down. And I think, um, I know actually a lot of people appreciated that, mm. that you were there for them. They were able to take away whatever their transformations were and they weren't pressured, like you said, to buy something else or jump into something else. So I thought it was, was brilliant. Cool. Um, Rich, what is one tip you would give speakers who aspire to improve their skills and become a master speaker like yourself? Practice. I mean, it just comes down to practice. You got to speak, you got to speak, you got to speak. It's, it's like anything else. I mean, you, you've got to know that it's 10,000 hours to mastery. And I almost certainly know I've logged more than 10,000 hours speaking. And so for a lot of people who are discovering that they want to be a professional speaker and generate an income doing so, they're discovering that in their, you know, their twenties or their thirties or their forties and some even later. And there's never, ever, it's never, ever too late to in fact start, but you got to know that a big part of what's going to have your speaking ability perfected is through practice. So I would, I would absolutely invite people to join a Toastmasters club, you know, get in front of rooms, speak as often as you, as you can. But, but if you don't feel like you can actually get the kind of practice hours in like you'd wish, then what you should then do is get really passionate about what it is that you're speaking about. And, and just because you feel quite lit up by what you think you're passionate about, it's interesting to see, Michelle, firsthand what people really are passionate about. And they're passionate about mattering. They're passionate about you know being up, up here in the eyes of people rather than where they think they might be. So they're looking for self-elevation. So if you, if you hear a real passionate person, you forget that they don't speak for a living. And I've met many of those people. I've met heads of, 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 of great charitable organizations. I've met people who are really passionate about stopping this or ending that. And they're just passionate. And that comes out as a stronger confidence than practice. So I think the first is practice. Number two is find what it is that you're really passionate about. But number three is, is get prepared, you know, get really prepared. I mean, I can tell you how much I prepare being in the position you're in, Michelle, or the position you're in, Jessalyn, where I really, in fact, even predict what my guests would say before interviewing them. So I'm able to really have a dialogue that's comfortable and familiar rather than trying to rely upon my knee-jerk reactionary commentary, which isn't always there. Not everyone can actually just riff. Not everyone can actually be improv. And then what ends up happening is that we rest on a lot of very comfortable, very familiar, nuanced uh, pocket statements. And, and, and it's okay, but you've got to notice that for yourself, where if, if left to your own devices, you'll rely on only, only those things. And then people start picking up on them. And then you dwindle down to the ums, ahs, um, ahs, and all of a sudden it's like, well, somebody shoot me, please, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you've, you've, got, you've got to practice. You've got to find what you're passionate about. But oh my God, you've got to be prepared. Because when people are listening, they're bestowing upon you a huge gift. And that gift is their time, attention, and care of listening to you. So reward them by telling them something that they would really like to know and or at least be moved by. I have to say, though, um, I've been coming to you like, I guess, what is it, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you've been inviting me and I'm a part of Rich U now. And I got to tell you, it's the best thing I've ever done. I think I feel and I see the change. So it's it's, you know, I think everyone should be a part of Rich U. Can you tell, you know, everyone a little bit about it? Well, Rich U is just our digital community. And, uh, you know, anyone can go to richarddolan.com. So Richard Dolan, D's and Delta, O-L-A-N, as you see on the screen. And uh, you can visit that site and you'll notice that all we have really for sale is really Rich U. So Rich U is our digital universe of academia, of programs, of learning. 
And so we've got uh, workshops, we've got courseware, we have certification program learning. We also have all of our recordings. So everything I've ever recorded in the world of uh, from the sport of money to the sport of rich, of course, those two things always about money, wealth and worth, uh, everything to coach to coach where I train people on how to coach other people uh, right through to courageous conversations where I've had an, an absolute blessed journey um, starting a little show during the pandemic to find out what my celebrity friends were doing to cope yet another week under quarantine. And I mean, three seasons later, never realizing the pandemic was going to run this damn long or else I would have stocked up on more booze. And I mean, we had a great time with it to the point where a studio picked it up and said, we're going to take it from here with you. So I'm, I'm super blessed to say that, you know, Courageous Conversations comes back in September. I'm uh, heading to LA in August to uh, film uh, 30 shows, which is going to be a marathon for me, uh, but an adventure at the same time. And uh, I'm really delighted to say that there's some incredible people that I would have never met, let alone get access to, had it not been for a studio saying, we like what you're doing and what you stand for. Let's put you in front of people that we know would really be powerfully moved by you, but you'll be able to powerfully move them. And uh, that's that's daunting. That's a cool task. But but it all started with Rich you. So, I mean, it's um, it's a small little community for a small amount of money. You can join. There's no contract, so you can cancel any time. There's no obligation. It's, it's pretty easy peasy. If you keep getting value, keep paying. If you don't get value, well, we won't take your money. And um, it's, it's, a, it's as simple as that. So I know that come September, most of our live coaching calls will pick back up again because we're giving people a little bit of their summer to enjoy their families, to you know return to prayer, to return to work, to get back to normal as the world kind of starts to return to business unusual. Um, but while they're doing that, we thought, hey, let's slow it down a little bit before we speed it back up. Yeah, that's super cool. Awesome. This one I really like. You see things in people that they don't see in themselves. How do you bring out the best in them? Well, I think that's a really charged question though, because you ask me two different questions. I think one is I see potential in people and, and then how do I bring the best out of them? And that's guided by a different commitment. So the first part I can say this is that for people who operate without any ego, they're able to see the best in others because they're not comparing themselves to anyone. I don't compare myself to anyone. I really don't. I don't. I used to. I mean, believe me, I used to go in the car and go for a drive. I'd be, I mean, I'd be driving through these rich neighborhoods. I'm like, damn, why they got so much money? How they, why they need such a big house? Damn it. Shit. Crap, let's, I'm getting out of here. And I'd be angry and be activated because I'd be like, I ain't, I ain't rich. I don't have that stuff because um, I'm comparing. We all are. And that's human nature. We, we benchmark. You know, you're, you're, you're at the same age as someone. Hey, what do they make? What do they have? Where are they at? Um, you know, what have they got? Oh, my God, look at my watch. Look at their watch. Look at their car. Look at my car. And so, and so we, we do that because by comparing, we know if we're succeeding. It's benchmarking. It's just what humans do. Are we getting ahead? Or are we falling behind? It's what the old days would call keeping up with the Joneses. And, and so for, for me, because I don't have anything operating over here, when I speak to someone, I hear a commitment in them to be more. I am now listening for what's between them and getting there, whether it's doing what they're passionate about, becoming what they've really wanted, or letting go and cutting loose the things that are holding them back. Now, the part of having people become great, right, is different because that's more on you. So it's how I tee you up to say, now, these are the first three things you should probably do. You should probably give yourself at least two, five, 10, 15 days to do them. And in fact, I'm so committed to hearing how you're doing with it. Why don't we check in with each other every two days and see how you're coming along? So, so discovering potential, to be quite honest, it's actually easy because guess what? Here's a secret. We all got potential. We all are operating at, 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 like at maybe that much of what we're really capable of doing because this whole existence of ours is rigged. We're, we're only designed to survive, not to succeed. That's all we are. We're only, we're only built, designed, and perfected to do one act, and that's survive. And survival equals small, insignificant, shriveled up, shrunken down, stalled, or stopped. Always. Maybe I should do this. No, you shouldn't really do this. Yeah, maybe you're right. You know, I would really love to be great. No, you wouldn't. That's great. It's not good. Okay, we'll stay small. And on it goes. So it's really easy to see the greatness in people. But the, re the, the really living it and getting to it, it's on you. 
not you like you, Michelle, or you, Jessica, but anyone that's listening to this, that's on you. So where do you know that lives? You got to commit on a daily basis to do one thing you wouldn't have predictably done every day. And then once you do one and you got it dialed in and you're consistently doing it, then you make it two. As Grant would say, just as we've talked so much about Uncle G, the 10X is, is not a straight line. You just don't go from here to 10X. You got to go from 1X to 2X to 3X to 4X to 5X. It's successive. It's progressive. It's not miraculous. So am I gifted? Probably. And I'm blessed for that. Am I trained? Hell yeah. I mean, by the world's best. And I'm grateful for that. Have I had time to fine tune those talents and gifts? Oh my goodness, yes. I've used these talents and gifts my entire life. Am I just getting started? Oh yes, I am. I mean, I feel like I'm just now finally growing into my resume where it's like, man, finally these shoes fit. But I've had this resume for 30 years. So, I mean, that's, that's really what it is. If you wanna learn how to do it, you've gotta observe it being done. And there's just not a lot of people in this industry of human improvement and betterment that are just really, truly, genuinely doing that for people. But I am, and I'm happy to share it. That's beautiful. Now, what are the most important things uh, to be rich in besides money? Can you tell everyone? Rich in the things that matter, Michelle. Rich in the things that matter. I mean, gosh, your answers could probably be automatic. And the one that probably comes out of your mouth is what your mother would want you to say. Or maybe your dad, depending on who you loved and admired more. But it is someone. It is often someone. And if it's not your parents, it's going to be your big brother, little brother, Uncle Jim, right? Aunt Mary. It's someone you admired. So, so oftentimes, rich for a long time was always about money. It was always about wealth and shiny things or great worth. But, but growing rich in the things that matter does not have to be monetary. doesn't have to be measurable by way of bank draft statement of account and or a net worth statement. You know, richer in the things that matter is really the beginning of living life by design and not by default. You know, being able to live on your terms and no one else's. Living an intentional life and not an automatic. And so when you start to really realize, oh my gosh, I really got a say in the matter. Yes, welcome back. <laughs> now let's get started. So uh, that's what it means. That's what it means to, to really grow, lead, and be rich in the things that matter. So how do you live the advice you give? Every day. Just, you just got to live it every day. People think that it's a destiny, it's a place, it's a journey. No, it's just every day. I mean, every day I don't win. Every day, sometimes I lose. Sometimes I fall off my horse and it's a high one. Sometimes I got to dust myself off. Sometimes I fall straight into my own shit and think, geez, what, what, this is a lot of crap. This is disgusting. This is, this is just the worst crap I've ever fallen in my, hey, this is my crap. This looks familiar and it happens. But I mean, you get up, you, you, you clean up and then you jump back on. So I think people have this really huge view that you've got to have some sort of great grand vision. No, just, just take every day by day by day, day by day, you know? And, you know, sometimes when we, when we're really obsessed about the past, um, you know, there's anger. Sometimes when we're always in fact thinking about the future, we're anxious. The real power is by just being present. And when you're present, you're still, when you're still all is possible. And, and that great wisdom is the wisdom of the Buddha. So you've got to know that for a lot of people, we're, we're always either angry or anxious, angry or anxious, right? In the past and the future, in the past and the future. Just stay here, stay still, chill out. Don't take your life so damn seriously. Stop being a living legend in your head. No one really is watching or gives a shit. You are the only audience that matters. Take care of yourself. Take care of your life. Take care of those around you that you love. Even if it's your dog, your cat, that's all that matters. And damn it, take care of them. And they take care of you. So just, just be present. Win, win every day. And then start to win two days. Then start counting your winning streak. Then when you hit a week, you celebrate the week. And then you do it again until it's a month. Until you turn a month into a quarter, a quarter into a year, a year into your life but you win life on your terms one day at a time. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We're going to take a commercial break and we'll be right back.
we're back with the master himself, Rich Dolan. Um, Rich, what led you to write musical meditations and how were those instructed? Because that impressed me. Oh my gosh, that's so funny you just said that because I just repackaged one because I broke one of the, you know how hard it is to find one of these things, the, the jewel case? So that's it right there. That's, that's, that was the very first wow. one. I don't know if you can see that. I can. It yeah. was the very first one. And uh, it was amazing because, well, first of all, all these CDs back in that time was really, truly, I mean, sensational. I, I don't even know if I have a CD player in my house, my home, my office, or my cars. I mean, it, it really is quite incredible. But I had this fascination that there was a way to create musical meditations because I know that oftentimes when people would listen to music, you get into a trance, but here's where the idea came from. Do you remember the song, Don't Forget Your Sunscreen? Now it's not, very, so it's not very famous. And, and I just proved the point that it's- I was gonna say, I honestly say I never heard of it, but- Don't forget your sunscreen. So it was just a, it was a song that at that time at the turn of the nineties and heading into the two thousands, there was this guy that would just kind of like talk through the lyrics, but it just sounded like he was reciting some statement if it were, but there was music in the background and this made it on popular radio channels. So as I heard it, I thought, though, this is both bizarre, but also quite amazing. So I thought, what if I were able to create inspirational, motivational, insightful content and, and parlay it with music that if you were to hear it on top of these beats, it would ground that insight in such a way that it wasn't musical by my taste. It was musical by your experience. So, you know, you started thinking about alpha waves and beta waves and what happens to the brain when, you know, beats per minute sped up and, and got elongated. So it, it, it was so good that I actually, in fact, went from, from not one, not two, but I actually, in fact, produced three. So I have these, I have three albums that I curated music for, and it was phenomenal. I felt like I was embodying Sean Puffy Combs. I felt like I was in there, but here's the coolest part. And I'm going to share this with you, Michelle, because you've got a history of, of having a big heart. And I'm not suggesting you don't, Jess, but I know Michelle in this domain because she's no stranger to music. Do you want to know where I found all the musicians, all my inspiration for the music? Street performers. Nice. I heard it impress Quincy Jones, too. Well, he was actually one of the cool cats that gave me, I don't know if you can see it in here. And I didn't put it on here, but he did, in fact, endorse the music. So cool. Um, which is really neat. I don't think he liked, I don't know if he liked the music. He just liked the fact he was, did you take motivational insights and parlay that with music? I'm like, yeah, he goes, cool, daddy. Oh, cool. <laughs> so great guy. But I mean, that's what was cool. So it, it was very neat to be able to um, find street performers who were just performing out of passion and maybe to make some ends meet. I, I then hired them, licensed music that they were creating and then did digital interfacing with that music so to create my own procurement of music nice. so what's neat is i've got this great arsenal of music that i've never released ever since but it lives on these cds so now you're making me be present to the fact that that music might have been timeless so it might be cool to bring it back to life yeah you need to make an mp4 of that and that needs to be sold i gotta do that maybe i'll bring it back that's what i'll do i'll bring it back because that's it's really cool here. I'm only, only because you're on the phone with me and doing this. I mean, gosh, when was this? Yeah. 2006. See, I did my research. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's really cool. I don't know if you can see that as I'm talking there, I'll just do like this. So I don't know if you see LL Cool J and I mean, there's Deepak Chopra and, 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 and Russell Simmons. I mean, yep. Russell Simmons at the time to endorse this, that was huge. That was huge. But um, even down to the, to the cover, I made that cover. I, that's my photograph. I'd like that boat one day, you know, that, that's I know, cool. kind of cool. But look at this, look, like how, how, how young do I look there? Am I not really young or <laughs> Wow, what? you look that's so like, Italian. I'm like 12. I think I was 12 years old. I didn't have a right to make any music. You actually look like a soap star. <laughs> you yeah, could have been really, on Days of Our Lives. Yeah, as the world turns. Yes. Anyhow, so that's, that's where that came from. And I'm really glad that you brought that up. That brought me back down memory lane, so thank you. Yeah, I th I'd, I'd love to hear some of that, Rich. So when you get a chance, you should you should share that. Yeah, sure. Um, so <laughs> you figured out to do that. Um, at what moment did you realize you were on the right track and doing exactly what you were called to do? 
That's a really good question. I don't know if I still feel I'm on the right track. I mean, I don't, I don't know if anyone ever feels like they're really on the right track because I think being on the right track is, is a measurement of two things. Like, you know, first of all, am I heading in the right direction? And the other question is, am I really happy with the direction, the speed and the progress I'm making on it? So am I doing the right thing right now? I am. I'm, I'm doing exactly what I was built to do for sure because I've never worked a day since discovering that. But, but am I happy with my progress? Am I happy with the impact? And to be quite frank, of course not. I mean, there's always more. There's always a difference to make. There's always new conversations to start. There's always new markets to hit. Uh, and not because it's about money. It's about just impact. So for, for me, I think for a lot of people, you, you just, you've got to be able to at least find a day where you get to be comfortable in your own skin. And I think I, when I discovered I was comfortable in my own skin was, was really when I, I began to say, I've got to go out there and make the difference I was, I was really created to make. And once that began to happen, um, probably about two years ago, just in time for the pandemic, which was the perfect time to come out and get discovered was when everyone had to go inside. <laughs> so perfect timing, um, but memorable. I mean, definitely memorable. And so it's, um, it's, it's where, it's where life is different. It's, it's where, you know, my, uh, my life at home is different. It's where those who love me and who I love and take care of is all different because I'm, I'm truly who I'm meant to be in the skin in which I've got. Hmm. I have a question. Sure. Um, so you've met a lot of incredible people. Hmm. What's the, what actually, who was your favorite and does your son want to be just like you? Cause I, I feel I'm getting, I'm going to get a little intuitive, but I feel like, you know, you're his idol. Yeah, I, I think, I think all of us growing up, our parents, of course, is our idol, no, no matter who you think you are and what you do or how great and grandeur you are. I mean, all mom and dads are their idol from the day children are born and brought into this world. Just think about it. They, they look up to you. You, you are their everything. You are their world. But um, my son, 14 years of age today, I mean, he's, he has a very different opinion and he's, he's definitely uh, vocalized about it. But we have a good relationship that's quite mature. I mean, he's he's my only son. He's my only child, and so therefore we're very close. And we're God very blessed. I know I'm very blessed. And um, but I take him to everything, so he's been exposed to a lot. I mean, but to the point where funniest moment. I mean, we're having dinner with Mike Tyson, his wife and family, and my son, being very young, falls asleep on Mike Tyson. And Mike's like, hey, you know, your son just fell asleep on me. What am I going to do here? Rit? I'm like, well, don't move, dude, because you know what it takes to put that guy to sleep? And so he's like, okay, I, I use my right man then. So you sleep, buddy, you sleep. I mean, oh that's God. cool. I mean, that's really cool. Um, Excellent. I mean, being able to introduce President Clinton to my family, my mother. Um, I mean, one of the most memorable things I was able to do, sidebar, because my mom passed just last summer was I was on a plane. I'll never forget this. I was on a plane and I was about to take off, but I was trying to, to, to curate an introduction of my dad and my mom to um, President Clinton and Secretary of State, uh, Secretary Clinton. So, so Hillary and Bill were in Toronto at a time that I'm just about to take off. And it was the worst day I should have taken off. I should have been at this event but I couldn't make the event. I had to fly somewhere. So my mom and my dad really wanted to meet them both together because it was rare that they both did speaking events together. And so what was really cool was being able to, collect, to, to connect with the office, to connect them all together backstage for one photo. And it was probably the greatest thing a son can pull off for, for a mom and dad, right? Like I, I introduced them there. So that was cool. But President Clinton by far is, 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 has been probably one of the most charming most memorable, most gracious people I've met. And I mean, I'm, I'm born Canadian, so I don't really have a, a, a political bone in my body that's US. So I don't, I don't bleed red or blue. So I don't see that like an American would, um, but I understand policies and, and regardless of the difference he made or didn't make, he, he, you all should know he was just, he was a really good guy and uh, really down to earth. And that's why I was really proud to have toured with him for as many times as I did. Um, very gracious, very gracious. But Oprah was cool. I mean, it's all true what they say about Ellen. Um, Michelle Obama, super tall, even for me at 6'2". I'm like, wow, pleasure to meet you. Super intimidating. I mean, 
Mike Tyson's amazing. Tiger Woods is quiet. Um, there's, there's, there's such a long list of people I've been able to work with. I think that I'm never starstruck. I'm just, every time I'm in the presence of anyone's greatness, I'm just really grateful. I mean, I'm just really allowing myself to be grateful. Yeah, truly. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So you said a life worth living means giving back to make the world a better place. What charities are closest to your heart? I mean, the best charity is my home. I mean, charity starts at home. I mean, I got to take care of people that are, that are, that are counting on me. Let's just be real. I mean, that's, that's number one. And I think charity is different than it was five years ago. I mean, charities like, you know, giving to uh, goodwill, which I do often, or I have been a big part of Habitat for Humanity for over 12 years. Uh, I mean, I've been, I've given money, but now, now we're in a different social consciousness. I mean, we're talking about movements. I mean, social equality. I mean, bringing awareness. Um, I've been doing some work with the Nelson Mandela Foundation. I've been working with the world of film uh, in a big way to bring light to stories that need to be told. Um, so I think charity is just contribution where there's no expectation on yourself from that contribution. So, you know, that to me is it. Do I volunteer? Yes. Um, do I do, do I volunteer and give to my church? Yes. And, uh, and I'm happy to do so, but it's never enough. And so I think in terms of charitable causes, I think there's still a place for that. But I think the charitable cause needs to be about bringing more awareness to social equality and an opportunity to those who are disadvantaged. I think that's, that's the, if that's a charity, then that would be where my, my charitable bandwidth would go to. And you were raised, um, you like lived with your grandmother, right? So did I, mm. believe it or not. That's um, right. My, my grandmother so, raised me. So it just proves a point that you can come from, you know, the lowest part and be so successful. It, it's like, I've, I've seen kids now just say they give up at like 13 years old. And I tried taking them off the streets and, you know, having them write rap in the studio and stuff. But I, I think if we could duplicate you and we find a way to duplicate you and we put you in schools and that's why I'm so pleased that you said you're going to, you're going to do something with teens because they're our future. Mm. And, and, and the thing is, is that the world needs to be a better place, you know? It, it, does. it really and it, does. And it needs, to, we need to start younger. I mean, self-discovery and self-defining and, and self-reclamation shouldn't start at the time in which we feel we're the most broken and where forgiveness has to be practiced and forgetting and getting complete and uh, reviewing our agreements and cleaning up our integrity. I mean, gosh, sometimes people get to that in their twenties, thirties, forties, fifties, sixties, sometimes never. So, so the, the technology of human alignment needs to be taught earlier on. And as a result, I believe that that's what we can do. Cause I see it in my son. I, I, I see my son, how, I mean, he's still a boy. I mean, he, you know, I mean, I, I still can't get him to make his bed. I still can't get him to do the things he needs to do, but he owns it. And so getting him to always get present at that is always about just shortening the margin of unwillingness, right? And so I'm grateful. I mean, in conclusion, being here with you, Michelle Mupo, and what you're doing is fantastic. I love that. Thank you. you know, what we've been talking about is, is a lot about me, but, and it's not about duplicating me. It's about really emulating what I'm talking about, because it's not me that needs to be replicated. What needs to be emulated is the education and transfer to others. So I think that when it comes to people building brands and, and starting careers and wanting to speak, go, go and just inspire people to really own themselves. And, and don't be afraid if you don't feel like your voice matters or if your, 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 your brand doesn't shine or if your followers don't come or your likes don't show up. We're not measured by any of those things in our final days. We're measured by the impact we've made and the difference we've, we've, we've kept. So just keep your eye on the real prize. And um, if, 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 if all else fails, just strive to be a living demonstration of the better version of yourself every single day in whatever area of your life you can. So I just, I just want to riff off that quickly. Obviously, I've been working with you for, for several years, Rich, but now we incorporate that, like you said, with our sons who are five and eight. And now we have people coming to us, like saying, that's incredible. Like parents don't do that with their kids. They don't worry about emotional intelligence they just 
you know, you go play or you go do that, but that's not how, you know, we work with our kids and that stemmed from a lot of learning from you. And so I a hundred percent, you know, love that we're going to reach out to teens and kids because like watching my kids as they grow and some of the things they go through and it's like, they don't have to suffer in that. We, we have the tools to teach them on how to believe in themselves, how to understand why they're mad or they're upset and, and their emotions so they can actually deal with it in a, a healthy way. So, yeah. Yeah. Listen, we're, we're, we're raising, we're raising adults that just currently are kids and mm-hmm. that's all that comes down to, but, but Michelle, listen, um, I'm grateful that I've been here. I, I, I love what you're up to. You have a fire in the belly that is just, you know, I mean, you just can't quench it. It's, it, it lives in, in you, your soul burns bright. I mean, you're on a mission and, and the world always will lean towards those who know where they're going. And you're certainly one of those that do. So, so congratulations you. to you. God bless you for the work that you're doing. Thanks for illuminating the path for me, my brand, my movement, and the people that are behind me. Uh, I'm grateful. I'm thankful. I'm humbled by it. And uh, I'm just wanting you to know that I love you for it. So thank you. Well, I love you too. So thank you for all you're teaching me to be a better person. And we're going to take a quick break and then we're going to wrap it up with Richard. Thank you, Richard. It's been a pleasure visiting with you. Look for Richard Dolan on audible.com and at his website, richarddolan.com, where you can learn how to shift your relationship with money, wealth, and worth and get a free download of Richology. You can follow, like, and subscribe to Richard on Facebook under Richard Dolan or at Richard Dolan Official, at richard.dolan on Instagram, on LinkedIn under rich-richard-dolan and at his website, richarddolan.com. That's a lot of information just to track me down. Good. You know, it's yes, funny. I mean, I, my, my mom called me one day, God bless her soul. And she says, I never knew. I said, what do you mean? She goes, I never knew. I said, what do you mean? She goes, I never knew you were a UFO guy. I'm like, that's not the right Richard Dolan. <laughs> and as always, thank you for tuning into Mubo and Friends, courtesy of Mubo TV. And you could watch all of our episodes anytime, 24-7 at www.mupoentertainment.com. That's www. M-U-P-O-E-N-T-E-R-T-A-I-N-M-E-N-T dot com. This is Jessalyn Pearson with our host, Michelle Mupo. Until next time. Have a Mupo awesome week. I love you. I appreciate you. you. Anything else you need, by all means, let me know, okay? Thank you. Thanks, Rich. Jessalyn, good to see you. Thank you. You bet. Okay. Bye-bye. Good good job, ladies. Thank you.